wouldn't it be helpful if we had a guidebook in terms of this is what my body needs in order to be successful? If I had a dime for every time I had a client come into my practice that said something to that effect, I would be a very rich woman. So I'm going to let you in on a little secret. There are actually some general rule of thumb rules to the road, so to speak, in terms of how to care for a bleeding body. And I'm going to let you in on the little secret. Join me this week and the next couple of weeks as I share some of these rules of the road and just what you can do to support your body best. Hi, I'm Adrienne Irizarry. I'm an Eastern medicine practitioner who is passionate about women's health and helping women live their best lives. My goal is to put you in the driver's seat of your menstrual health, offering period solutions for a symptom-free life. Statements made in this program are for educational purposes only and not intended as a substitution for medical consultation or advice. We do not claim to diagnose, treat, or cure any diseases. This podcast is inclusive and welcomes all gender identities. The focus of the program is on biological function and we will use the term women throughout, but it is referencing physiological and social challenges for biology, not identity. Come as you are, I am happy you're here and welcome all performances of identity. I hope you find something helpful in this show. Welcome back to another episode of the Reproductive Rebel Podcast. I am so excited this week to let you in on some of the little secrets that we should have been taught when we were younger. So... In my practice, so many times I have women come into the practice and be like, man, like if there were just like a short list of things that I knew in terms of being able to take care of myself, that would make this so much easier. And the truth is, from a Chinese medicine perspective, there are. And I'm going to let you in on some of those little secrets in the next few episodes. So this week, we're going to talk about the rules of the road and number one, keeping yourself warm. I know that sounds super simple. And in an age where at the time of this recording, the in fashion styles is everything being a crop top. Every time I see a crop top, I cringe because you're exposing the part of your body that really needs to have the emphasis in terms of keeping warm. So let's talk about this. I actually did a post on social media. I did a reel a little while back where I was essentially growling about where the hell did the rest of my shirt go? (laughs) Because everything is a crop top. And while people think this fashion trend is super cute and like, look at this shirt, like the fact that we're literally missing half the fabric of our clothing does cause period problems. I have more girls with very concerned parents that bring their daughters to me between the ages of 14 and 20 recently. And it's really being driven very much by this fashion trend. So why is this? Okay. So staying warm isn't just a matter of like feeling warm in your body. This is actually keeping certain parts of your body warm and facilitating healthy circulation. So again, why I am absolutely crazy about this fashion trend of short tops. I mean, I even had a postpartum mom send me this link the other day of a nursing shirt for postpartum that was a crop top. Like, let's think about this for a second. We've really taken this to an extreme Not only do postpartum moms need the warmth in order to help their recovery and speed healing, but also anyone who's listening to this who has ever had a child for freaking real who wants to expose their belly skin like that. Like, not many people. So the person who devised this shirt as being something fashionable, I assure you, has probably never had a child. And If you are that person and you're listening to this, feel free to email me and challenge that. But 
the vast majority of moms, there is a reason why the term mom jeans came into existence because they were higher waisted. When you have loose skin after having a small child, you want to hold all of that in, not expose it and hang it out. But anyway, I digress. So not only is it a not attractive fashion trend for the vast majority of us, because women are supposed to have a little bit more in the midsection. We are supposed to have, as one of my beautiful colleagues call it, the power pooch, right? Because it is a sign of health and fertility and reproductive wellness to have a little bit of something that's protecting your reproductive organs. Chinese medicine actually like favors there being a little bit more cushion on the body in terms of being able to get pregnant because it shows that this is not a deprived landscape. There's no scarcity here. It is an abundant, fertile place for a baby to grow. Whether that's your reproductive goal or not, this is part of how you solve period problems. So I go back to the fact that I have a large number of girls between 14 and 20 that come into my practice right now absolutely suffering with period pain. Cramps that take them out of classes, cramps and migraines, and being so physically in pain that they throw up. Does this resonate and land with anybody? This is being driven by a circulation-related challenge. And exposing your midriff is a big part of what's driving that problem. Because since this fashion trend has changed, so my practice has been in existence for a while, and I've watched some patterns emerge as fashion trends have changed. And there were a little bit different experience with period related problems when scarves were fashionable and everybody was wearing one. There's a reason for that. And we'll talk about that in a second. When shirts were longer, when you had the tank tops that were the long line tank tops and they'd come down to like the top of your hip, again, did period problems happen back then? Sure. But did I see them with the alarming, sharp pain that we're getting now? No, not the same way. Were people still struggling? Yes. Why? Our world is stressful. This causes circulation to slow down. Just think about when you feel stressed. Your muscles feel tight. Your shoulders might get tight. You might get a tension headache, right? There's a constriction, a tightening that happens. Your circulation fluids, and energy are not moving smoothly through your body. So there is absolutely nothing different when you're talking about the reproductive system. So if you're exposing your midriff and your belly is not being kept warm, you're opening the door for more circulation issues. Now, we generally struggle with circulation in the lower part of our body, okay? And the reason for this is the upper two-thirds of our body keep us alive. So if you didn't have legs, you still need your stomach, you still need your lungs, your heart, your brain in order to keep you alive, right? No legs is super inconvenient. However, it doesn't change whether you can be a thriving human being. But if you are unable to digest your food, if you're unable to breathe, if your heart isn't pumping properly, if your brain isn't able to communicate these things to your vital organs, you have challenges in terms of your survival, right? So in general, the body prioritizes what's going to keep you alive versus what's not going to keep you alive. And unfortunately, your uterus is a second-class citizen. You would need to survive and get away from the tiger in order to live right? And the idea of being able to procreate is so much secondary to your ability to survive and stay alive. So because of that, the body tends to prioritize where those energetic resources go based on that understanding. 
So it is not uncommon when we stay in a stressed state to have cold feet, cold lower legs, issues with circulation in our lower legs, or maybe even edema and swelling in your lower legs. So have you ever taken your socks off at the end of the day and noticed that you have like a, an indent where your socks like pushed into your ankles or your calves? That is a mild form of edema, meaning that your body isn't transforming the fluid and moving the fluid appropriately in the lower part of your body, and it's pooling, it's sitting down there. Okay, so circulation challenges in the lower part of the body are common just day to day. Why? Our nervous system is not able to keep up with the speed and demands of everyday life. We are meant to take more breaks and our social constructs don't allow us to do that. We actually, as bleeding bodies, need to move a lot slower than we think we need to. And we need to do it with a mind's eye towards where we are in our cycle and our stage of life. So we already have a circulation compromised lower body, right? Any sort of life stress, anything like that will compromise the circulation in our lower body. Now, let's talk about all the ways that we don't cover that lower body. Okay, so keeping warm, you have to think like you're dressing for the wind outside. Very fitting since I'm recording this on a super windy day at my house. And the wind outside, if you think about what you wear when you go out into the wind, even on a warm day, we tend to throw on an extra layer or maybe we'll put a scarf around our neck. It might be a light one because it might be summertime. It doesn't really matter what the season is. Whenever there is wind outside, we tend to pull our clothing closer to our body to keep the wind out, okay? So wind is how illness gets into our body and disharmony can get into our body. So if you think like you're protecting your body against a windy day, that actually is a really good benchmark to understand how you should be dressing your body on a regular basis. So during your bleeding time, that is the most important time to make sure that your whole body is covered. And when I say whole body, I am saying no exposed midriff. I'm saying put something on your feet, like light socks instead of sandals or something like that. Even a hot day in the summertime, you still very often will notice your toes will be cool if you're wearing sandals when it's super hot out and you're on your bleeding time. My husband laughed at me when I first started doing this work and making these meaningful changes in my own lifestyle. My husband used to tease me about the fact that I would wear a light scarf on an 80 degree day when I was having my period. And he goes, oh my God, aren't you hot? I'm hot just looking at you. And I'm like, actually, I'm kind of comfortable as weird as that sounds. And it's because it helped protect my body against wind. So a light scarf, having a shirt that covers up to your collarbones during your bleed, having a shirt that is long enough that it covers your torso. Yes, there are high-waisted pants and I've had teenagers make arguments with me about, well, you know, I have a shorter shirt, but I have higher pants. There's a space in between that air gets in. Any way you look at it, you do have compromised circulation. In Japanese culture, they have this, it looks kind of like a belly band. It's called a haramaki. And they wear it underneath their clothing when they are postpartum to keep the heat in. They'll wear it during their bleed to keep the heat in. If people are yang deficient, meaning that they're a little more brittle to the colds than the average person, and that can be something that can make it hard for fertility, conception, continuing a pregnancy. It's really common for people who are yang deficient to have issues with miscarriage. Wearing a haramaki or a long line shirt during the early stages of pregnancy can help keep the constitutional heat in. All 
are you over 35 years old and starting to feel like something is shifting in your body? Maybe you've reached 40 and you're starting to look at your period and go, what is going on here? This isn't like it always was. Or maybe you're starting to feel a little bit of the hormonal weight gain, the emotional roller coaster, and so much more. These are all things that you'll see in the perimenopausal period. And we don't talk nearly enough about what's happening during perimenopause. Join me on April 17th from 6 to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for coming into second spring. What is second spring? This is when we go through our perimenopausal and menopausal journey. And I want to make sure that you can address any of the negative symptoms as you're going through this phase and teach you what's actually going on inside of your body. The link to register is in the show notes. Join me on April 17th at six o'clock. There will be a recording circulated afterwards because this period of our life, we should thrive and not merely survive. And now back to the show. So warmth is really important for fertility, for decreasing period problems, for reducing the size of clots. I can't help but laugh at this point just because I've had so many people say this to me. But over the years, so I had this little mini course. It's called Proper Period Care. So if you really want to dive into this, it's really inexpensive. It's on my website. Check it out. It's short. It just gives you an overview of like, here are the basics of how you should care for yourself during your bleeding days. But keeping warm is really kind of an all cycle long thing because warm feet are fertile feet. Okay. That's a Chinese medicine saying warm feet are fertile feet. So whether fertility is your goal or not, keeping your feet warm that's the longest, lowest part of your circulatory system, right? It's the furthest away from everything. So if it's cool, it's saying, hey, circulation and warmth aren't moving down here the way that they should. So if you keep your feet warm, it helps to warm everything above it. So your feet are warm, your abdomen stays warm. Sometimes people will put their hands on their abdomen and they'll realize that it's cool to the touch. That speaks of circulation-related challenges. There are certain types of clots that show up when your abdomen is cool to the touch. There's a certain pain pattern in your period that shows up when your abdomen is cool to the touch. When you have issues with your feet and lower legs staying warm, there are certain patterns that show up in your period. So keeping your body warm now, not to the point where you sweat and you're overheating and you feel disgusting, but keeping yourself comfortably warm is really important. And when we're bleeding bodies, it's harder to keep ourselves warm because our blood serves like coolant in a car. When the level drops too low, we have certain issues, right? And it helps to control the temperature in the radiator engine, all of these things, right? So when the level starts to get too low and there's too much heat in there, there's a little indicator light that comes on on the dashboard. I don't know if some of you are familiar with that, but I've always been taught to not, not ignore the idiot lights on the dashboard. But one of them, it looks like a little thermometer and it will pop on. It's the best analogy that I have for what happens inside your body. So as your bleeding commences, your fluid level begins to change. It influences your experience, your fragility against cold and the experience with your circulation. Why? Because you are losing fluid in your body. You're supposed to do this every month. It is healthy and normal to do this every month. But in order to support the efficiency of that happening, not bleeding more days than necessary, not having symptoms, that type of thing. One of the foundational components, one of the key components to being successful is keeping your body warm. Now, I've had to negotiate with some of these younger people that come through my practice doors and go, but this isn't fashionable. 
And I'll tell them, well, okay, can we at least compromise? And on the days that you're bleeding, make sure that you're fully dressed. And then, you know, we could be a little more lenient outside of that. And they see such a big difference just in this one change that they fight me less on it month over month. The severity of their period pain comes down. I think about this with people who wear deep V-neck shirts too. It has nothing to do with showcasing the goods. It has everything to do with the fact that your neck, your upper chest gets cold. When people have breast tenderness or their breasts feel really heavy and distended and heavy before their period, it is showing a circulation-related challenge. If you keep your body covered and warm, you don't have to go with mittens and a hat and like you don't have to go crazy extreme. I mean, unless you live in a cold place, but keeping these areas covered, even like a t-shirt in the summertime that is like a crew neck t-shirt, right? So it comes up over your collarbones, but your arms are still exposed. That helps. Rather than your deep V-neck where you're exposing half of your chest and it's not covered, again, you're protecting against wind. You are more likely to get sick in the days leading up to and in the beginning of your period. You're more susceptible to catch things because your defense system comes down as the energy descends in your body for your period to begin. So as that force field comes down, and any of you who've ever seen Star Trek, this is totally the visual I get in my head. I'm totally a geek. Where, you know, they're taking fire on the bridge of the ship. And as soon as they lose their shields, it, the whole experience with being bombarded changes. And they're taking damage instead of just being rocked by what's being fired at them, right? The same thing is true here. Your body can defend itself until that shield comes down. Then the more you protect your system and the less hard it has to work to stay warm, the less hard it has to work to defend you against things that might be challenging your immune system to execute the period itself because we actually don't give enough credence to how hard our body works to execute this period every month. It has to build blood and then it loses and it needs to replenish every single month. It makes our diet really important. It makes our lifestyle choices really important. It makes this warmth thing critically important. Because if your body has to work hard to stay warm and it has to work hard to fight things off, right? So it just compounds on itself because it's working hard here. It's working hard here. It's working hard here. It makes it more tired. You can't hold all of those plates in the air at the same time. Our bodies are not designed for that. So keeping yourself warm. Think about all the creative ways that you can do that. It could be a light scarf. It could be wearing shirts that come up to your collarbone. It could be making sure that your shirts are long enough. It covers your whole torso. Maybe you wear something like a haramaki underneath a sweatshirt so you have an extra layer underneath a t-shirt, under a sweatshirt, for example. Maybe you're wearing socks on a day that you wouldn't normally wear socks with your shoes. You're wearing long pants. That's another place that I tend to, I hate to use the word biohack, but that's what's coming to my mind right now. This is a place that I try to conserve energy, is even in the summertime, if I'm wearing a dress, I'll wear capris under it or I'll wear leggings under it or something like that so that I'm covered down to at least the knee. And it makes it so that everything under my dress stays warmer and the circulation isn't as compromised. I'll probably not wear a dress as much as I love them. I tend to not wear dresses as much when I'm on my period because draft. And if I'm wearing capris or longer line shorts that come down to my knee, you know, I've been ragging on short shirts, but short shorts are also abounding right now where there isn't much between your butt cheeks and the rest of the world. And while I don't have a problem with super short shorts, when you're on your bleed, 
the more skin that you expose, the harder your body has to work to move your circulation and regulate your temperature. So again, these are ways to create small shortcuts. So maybe it's four days that you wear yoga leggings or you wear yoga capris. Get a super cute pair and wear them with a cute top. You don't have to look like a bag lady during your period, but these tiny little changes that you make to prevent more of your skin from being exposed for the few days that honestly you feel kind of introverted and want to take a nap anyway, honor that. And you'd be surprised how that one little change makes a huge difference in terms of your experience with pain, your experience with clots, the duration of your period, the flow of your period. It's such a small change. And some people fight with me. Again, I'm not bagging on young people, but that, that tends to be the demographic that likes to fight me the most about this idea. And yet the severity of their symptoms are taking them out of their social lives. So when they start making these changes, all of a sudden they're like, oh, now I see why you're having me do this. And while I might not be the epitome of fashion, I feel a lot better. I can still socialize with my friends. I'm not missing school. I'm not missing activities that I want to do. It makes a big difference. So I invite you with the coming of your next bleed to take a look at what you're choosing to wear in your wardrobe and get creative about how you're going to keep your body warm and protect against wind. Because the better your circulation moves because it is being kept warm, the more efficient, effective, and less symptomatic your period will be. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Reproductive Rebel. Reproductive Rebel is recorded by certified peristeam hydrotherapist and acutonics practitioner, herbalist, and Chinese nutritional therapist, Adrian Irizari of Moon Essence LLC. If you are interested in setting up an appointment for one-on-one -on -one support, ordering from our store, or checking out our course offerings, visit our website at moonessence.life. Be sure to subscribe to our newsletter and get insider information on upcoming events and offerings. Join the conversation. Like and follow us at Moon Essence Me on Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn. Your voices make this program possible. Thank you all for your continued support.